I think we're ready to start. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank, us, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us here this afternoon on day one of the World Economic Forum. Those buildings, this is quite enjoying this one. I think we're ready to start. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Thank, us, uh, thank you very much for, for joining us here this afternoon on day one of the World Economic Forum on Africa 2016. Now, there are no industry more important in Africa than agriculture. We know that 40% uh, of food currently produced does not make it from farm to fork. There's a huge wastage issue that leaders have been grappling with for some time. We know that there is a, no bigger employer. 400 million or 65% uh, of Africans rely on agriculture for their income. We know that for Africa to progress and move up the value chain, it needs to develop better facilities, and storage is one of them. So I'm very delighted. Right at the end of the, uh, the closing of our Grow Africa Investment Forum, which happened across town this morning over the past couple of days, to be able to be joined by some of the leaders here who are going to announce a very ambitious scheme to open up and, 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 and produce one million ta tons of cold storage. Now, to tell that story and to give a bit of, a, a bit of, a, uh, of an insight into the processes and, and what exactly it means and what's going to be done, what kind of action we're going to see, I'm very delighted to be joined by my first panelist, Agnes Matilda Kalibata, President of the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, and of course, delighted to say a member of our Global Agenda Council on Food and Nutrition. My second guest is Geraldine Mukashimana, Minister of Agriculture and Animal Resources here in Rwanda, and of course, Jay Shroff, Chief Executive Officer of UPL in India, who's been instrumental in getting this program off the ground. Agnes, if I could start with you to give us uh, some insight into what this scheme means. It's a very ambitious target you've set yourself. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so the institution that I lead, the Alliance for Green Revolution in Africa, uh, AGRA, um, focuses on working with smallholder farmers and increasing pro and helping them increase productivity by ensuring that we really focus on the things that are holding smallholder farmers back. Now, one of the areas that have been identified as very uh, critical to, to supporting farmers, but is also a, a low-hanging fruit on the continent, is um, the area of potatoes. Today, between three countries in East Africa, uh, Kenya, Uganda, and, and Rwanda, 1.7 million farmers are producing 6 million tons of potatoes. But this could actually be 120 million tons of potatoes. So these farmers are held back by a number of factors, cold storage being one of them, um, access to the right input systems being another, uh, disease management being another, right seeds, and you know, credit, our presidents in the morning, we are talking about all the challenges that are holding back the agricultural sector. We had that, and these are the very challenges that are holding back the potato industry, except the potato industry also suffers from being highly perishable. The potatoes are quite perishable. And because of that, cold storage becomes a significant need. Today, we have a growing industry in potatoes that is mostly fed from imports. In nearly every chip you eat in a decent hotel in Africa is imported. Just think about it. Every time you're eating a potato chip, that potato chip has been imported. Yet we are consuming lots of potatoes. Because, you know, the reason they have to be imported today, because there's an industrial process that happens that gets potatoes to those chips through a pre-cooking uh, pre process, I would call it. So hotels actually import them when they are nearly done. So the reason there hasn't been major investment opportunities in that is because of lack of cold chain. Potatoes don't stay long enough. We produce potatoes on the season, and they don't stay long enough for an, an industry to be supported. So today, we are very proud to be going into partnership with a number of uh, institutions that have seen the need. Governments, definitely, the government of Rwanda has been a champion in this business, really uh, ensuring that potatoes, that farmers that are producing potatoes see a rise, and the minister will talk about that. There's been a major increase in potato production in the last few years, but also there could be much more. Um, the government of Uganda also is engaged in this, and the government of Kenya is engaged in this. So th this is going to be a partnership between governments between um, investors and UPL, as they will be saying, uh, they will be telling us later today, are uh, looking to be investing, and they'll talk about it. But we also have other investors that are looking to bring in finance. We also have other investors that are looking to bring in input systems. All the things that I talked about that are weaknesses in the, in the 
in the environment, in the landscape of potato growing and potato processing so that we get a potato on the table that is not only grown in Africa but is also processed in Africa. So that's, the, the, that's what we are going to be discussing today and the uh, minister. I hand back over to you. I hope, I'm going to hand right back over to the minister. It's a, it's a fascinating story, and you, as you say, you're stuck with the low-hanging fruit. I'd love to hear more about the Rwandan story, what efforts you've been made so far to move up the value chain, and, and what this project means to you doing your job. The agriculture in Rwanda is uh, trying to address the production issues through a value chain approach all the way from research, production, and post-harvest uh, handling and management. So um, we have been investing a lot of money into production factors, but also into post-harvest management because we know that in this country there are two main factors that we need to focus on, the increasing the productivity but also reducing post-harvest losses. So the government of Rwanda has been dealing in uh, reducing post-harvest uh, 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 losses in a different ways by providing warehouses, making uh, rural roads, and so on. But this area of uh, uh, commodities that are consumed or sold as uh, fresh uh, commodities, we have not been doing as well as we wish, while the, in the area of potatoes, there are some processing industries coming in uh, chip making, uh, uh, frozen uh, fries coming in. So the issue is that how these uh, processing plants are going to have sustainable supply of raw material. So this project is going to be tackling that, but on top of that, it's critical that the uh, small holder producers are getting access to markets. So it's important that this project is going to be to be bridging the gap in the middle between the production and the market access. Thank you. Thanks. Jay Shroff, you're the Chief Executive Officer of UPL, you're based in India. This is, a, this is not CSR, is it? This is, a, this is a business venture for you. Tell us about a, a bit about why you're getting involved. Sure. So um, on, uh, UPL and UPL Foundation are very excited to be part of this project. Uh, we have been uh, working on it for more than three years. Uh, uh, with uh, Minister Ka Kalibata, and we are very pleased that uh, it's seeing the light of the day. There's a lot of discussion going on on, on this project uh, with many uh, different stakeholders. Um, but UPL, you know, we, we are involved in bringing technologies to farmers to improve farm productivity. And uh, the, the biggest challenge uh, we find that in Africa is that f uh, improving farm productivity does not necessarily mean um, the improvement, improvement in prosperity. And soon we realize that connecting uh, the smallholder farmers to value chain is, is re the really critical missing link uh, in Africa. To improve uh, small farmer or farmer prosperity, they need to have, and to Im get, get them to have sustainable income, the key challenge is to really connect them to value chains. And when we look more carefully at how do we connect to value chains and how do we get farmers to really grow higher value crops, we uh, realize that uh, there is uh, almost no existence of cold chains in, uh, in, in uh, this part of Africa and many parts of Africa. And so uh, to really make agriculture more sustainable, to increase the farm economy, to improve uh, uh, the really revenues, this is, we believe, the hu biggest impact uh, imp impactful investment uh, is, is investing in cold chain. And this discussion has led to uh, this project where we uh, will have a million tons of uh, 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 cold chain, primarily focused initially on potatoes, but obviously available on, for other perishable uh, farmers, uh, f uh, farming produce. And uh, we believe there's enough market in Africa itself, but if Africa is to export high quality foods, um, you know, we need to have a cold chain where the farmer can can uh, can use to 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 really uh, 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 you know deliver high quality goods uh, not only in within Africa but also export it. So um, long term, this sort of investment uh, w will really impact uh, uh, the whole economy, as we've all known, and I think uh, uh, with with the whole commodity price. Uh, 
uh, uh, you know, difficulties the world is facing. Um, I think most governments have realized, most presidents have realized that uh, making sure that agriculture is uh, profitable and sustainable, uh, small farmer agriculture, even large farmer agriculture is sustainable, is critical to the economies of uh, Africa. And if the world, uh, uh, if we need to really have uh, sustainable food supplies, Africa is going to be a key um, key player in the future. And uh, this sort of investment which we are uh, initiating um, is, uh, is going to be uh, uh, critical for this. Thanks. Thanks very much. I'm happy to take questions from the floor. <laughs> I'm going to start with one of my own. This is an ambitious scheme. It's uh, two billion dollars of investment is going to be mobilised. So commend commendable start. But what are we going to see first? What are the mechanics? How can we start seeing this this plan um, put into practice? And what kind of timeline are we looking at? Maybe I'll take a, 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 sh a sh uh, go at it. Um, what we are going to see first is the convening, the getting together. So part of what we've been working on, uh, this is a, this is a discussion that has been happening for probably th over three years now. Yes. through the Africa mm -hmm. Forum. So one of the things that Africa does well is to bring people together. And through Africa, we, we did meet um, Jay and his company, UPL, and we've been st we started a discussion where the Rwanda government expressed interest, and now three other, two other countries have expressed interest. Uh, we've also gotten a, a whole list of uh, people that are interested, other investors that are looking at the opportunities that are getting created around this value chain. Like I said earlier, the people who are looking to sell inputs to farmers. Once a farmer has a market and, and sees the real, real value in that market, they'll start buying s real good seeds, good quality seeds, and they'll start buying uh, fertilizers so that they can increase their produce, so that they can move from five tons to 25 tons. That's where we want to be. So the role of Agra in this is to help in that system of, uh, first of all, convening, getting people together to have a discussion around who is investing in what, number one. Number two, to support where needed in investing on the part of farmers to ensure that the level of aggregation in terms of getting the yields and, and the, the produce that we want to see going to these warehouses is actually happening. So it's, it's really, our role is going to be mostly bringing people together number one, and supporting, bring, p putting resources on the table to support farmers to do the aggregation part. And Joy, when are we going to see the first facilities coming online? So, um, I mean, we are in uh, active dialogue with uh, the three governments, uh, the ministers here. We were just talking uh, about the nitty gritties about energy costs and how we're going to make it affordable. I think that, uh, you know, from, from our side, we are very eager to move ahead and uh, we have committed that the first uh, few uh, ones we, w we are willing to commit or whatever resources necessary to get the pilots off the ground. Uh, we believe that end of 2017 is, uh, is feasible. Uh, we, we are hoping that we get all the uh, permits and whatever necessary paperwork uh, we can move quickly. Sometimes these things take some time, but we have uh, two very important people from uh, from from these countries here, and I think uh, we should be able to get uh, them off the ground um, in in uh, uh, middle to late uh, 2017. Fantastic. And, and Agnes, you hinted at the question I'm about to ask, which is, it's, a, it's this is a low hanging fruit. What's what's been holding us back? Is, this is an obvious missing link in the, in moving out the value chain is having cold storage facilities. Yeah, yeah. I guess the the most critical part is the fact that. Potato is a perishable crop. It can't be stored for very long. The markets become erratic because of that. They get concentrated around the production time. And because of that, farmers lose so much. A farmer could be making a thousand dollars a ton. Today, a Rwandan farmer makes two hundred dollars a ton. So it, that's where I say it's a low-hanging fruit. It's also a low-hanging fruit because the market is increasing as, as most of these countries start becoming moving towards middle-income countries as they start moving towards, I mean, Rwanda and, 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 and Kenya, for example, and even Uganda have been growing very fast. Part of this growth is influencing eating habits. And one of the things that is getting consumed more and more is potatoes. So it's, it's a really lucrative business, except farmers are not gaining from it, except it's not structured enough to allow industrialization to start happening. So that's why I say it's a low hanging fruit. For, it has huge potential for farmers, but also it's, it has huge potential 
for economic, wider economic benefits. Uh, uh, Madam Minister, finally, how does this, um, how does, how does uh, this scheme uh, tie in with other efforts to move up the value chain? And what are your uh, expectations? What, 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 what structure, what form will the agriculture in Rwanda have in the, in the years ahead? What are you building to? What's your vision? Actually, in Rwanda, this area of uh, potato production is uh, pretty advanced. As we speak, the farmers are really interested in increasing their productivity, and I think we are the highest uh, country that is uh, having a good productivity in potatoes, and uh, uh, we have been setting up aggregate aggregation points so that uh, the people coming to buy the potatoes, they are well knowing where to get it from, and we are in the process of establishing a wholesale market for the potatoes. But as I mentioned before, being a highly perishable product, it's important that we think of uh, ways of uh, uh, storing it. I know this project has been discussed for almost three years, and uh, what has been uh, holding us back was uh, the cost of energy. So as um, this country has uh, a huge ambition of getting electricity to at least 70% of our population by 2018. So with that pace of uh, 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 increasing electricity access and uh, looking at how much uh, investment that government is putting at generating electricity but also at uh, transporting it into different areas, we see it as an opportunity to start thinking of all these kinds of investment. Fantastic. Gentlemen over there, so we, can we have a microphone please? I know your name, but my colleagues here might not, so please let us know who you are and where you're from. Okay, thank you. My name is Colin Smoy. I'm a writer with the New Times Daily. Um, my end is um, to Madam Kalali Bata and, 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 and anybody else on the panel. One of the, one of the biggest reasons why Africa has not been able to feed itself is because a large number of farmers across the continent or in the sub-Saharan African um, uh, smallholder farmers, they have traditional practices and most of their produce is for, sub, is, is for subsistence use. So now that you have a storage a, a cooling facility, how are you going to make sure that or, or what mechanisms are in place to, to change the productive, uh, to, to, to improve uh, the volumes of, of, of production to, to not only export but actually feed the, 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 the continent? Thank you. And which other three can, and which other two two countries are, are on board? Thank okay, you. So is it is it build it and they come? How can you guarantee that people are going to to, to use these facilities and, and how can we turn that into export rather than import? I think the minister mentioned it already. She's, the minister said they are working on aggregation centres already, and that's a real uh, step forward in in many ways, making sure that farmers are coming together. And in addition to aggregation systems, is also working on productivity to ensure that farmers are getting higher returns per unit. I mean, um, potato f farming is one of the areas where you actually the possibility to incre increase the unit per, per, per hectare for a smallholder farmer is, the, is one of the largest. So there's real value around that. So um, the, the, I think the benefit that farmers will see in cold storage that they will want to be part of it is because there's a real value to increase. Now, they can move from the subsistence that you're talking about, of five tons, which farmers you know, do when they don't have any reason to do more, to 30 tons, to 25 tons, to 30 tons. And I mean, picture a farmer earning 30 tons versus the five tons, it's, it's a huge difference. And the cold storage will allow this farmer to store these potatoes and be able to sell whenever the market uh, is, 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 uh, is functioning to its benefit. So this is a real opportunity, and I think that's going to be the largest incentive. But also, uh, I mean, the, to me, the, what I had said earlier is, is also the incentive, the, the impact it's having on the larger economy, the fact that now other processes that were not happening on industrializing and adding value to potatoes are going to happen because potatoes will be available throughout the year through cold storage. So there's a huge incentive for farmers to be part of that, and I'm sure uh, it, it, it's not a very hard sell. Uh, and Colin, you're asking which countries were uh, involved in this scheme? Yes, the, the countries invo involved in this scheme is Rwanda, uh, Uganda, and Kenya. 
the three actually the three largest producers of potatoes in the region. Yeah, I can go. Uh, so one of the the key uh, <coughs> challenges in this project, or to make it successful, is really to create uh, 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 you know va uh, uh, industry around uh, uh, the crop. So we want potato processing industry set up. Uh, we are going to invite other players. Um, uh, local and international players to set up potato processing companies. We are talking to, uh, uh, you know, multilateral organization. We are talking to NGOs. Is that how can you help make this sustainable by making sure you procure um, uh, higher value added uh, crops from that? We have uh, realized in many parts of the world, particularly in India where we are from, is that when an industry is set up, they are willing to pay a little higher price uh, for s sustainable, sus good quality of, of, uh, of product. So they can onward sell a more uh, uh, good quality product. And, and this really creates the, uh, the, the, the whole chain where if I'm, I'm developing a brand of high quality product, I need high quality raw material. So we are looking for partners who will set up processing industry uh, around these cold chain units uh, to, to uh, uh, buy potatoes around the year. Either the farmer can own the potatoes or the, uh, the processing uh, industry can buy it in the beginning of the season and store it. So it will be a mixed model. And, uh, uh, and we think that uh, this will give the farmers an option to sell potatoes three months later, four months later, when the prices are much higher, when all of them are harvesting it together. So uh, it's a very exciting thing, and we think it will take some time for everybody to, to digest it. But once it kicks off, uh, we're going to see a huge uh, revolution of uh, uh, you know, people, fo farmers fo focusing on increasing yield and using whatever tools they can to increase productivity. Thank you, Jay. One last question from me, taking advantage of my position here to ask what I want. Mm -hmm. Agnes, you mentioned this is a low-hanging fruit, obviously. Is it, is it the, the one missing link between getting Africa um, to have you know, a, a food processing industry of, of note and to become a real exporter. Are there any other pain points we should also be looking at that you're looking at that we might be hearing about in the future? Oh, uh, there are a number of them. Um, during the, this Grow Africa meeting, a number of other communities were discussed, inclu including, uh, but not limited to, including rice. Uh, there was a, there's a, a rice value chain going on, really looking to to, to ensure that Africa becomes self-sufficient in rice, given that we have huge areas that we are not using, huge tracts of land. There was also, um, there's also a value chain happening around cassava. And uh, so, so when I say value chain uh, happening in Grow Africa, it means that the, the critical partners have been catalyzed enough and see the opportunities enough to want to come together so that they start investing to ensure that um, the $40 billion in food import bill that Africa is actually experiencing that is going to grow to $110 billion in, by 2025 in less than another 10 years is, is going to be also catalyzing African markets. That's a huge opportunity. And people are beginning to look at how do we start working to catalyze these uh, Africans to take advantage of their own market. Another value chain that we are looking at with UPL actually is, is pulses. You know, how do we start uh, working on ensuring that farmers who are producing pulses, whether it's beans, whether it's all sorts of uh, pulses that we have in the region, cow peas, uh, pigeon peas, are, are taking advantage of the markets that are being created around in India and, and other continents that are looking for those opportunities. So, so it's, it's a beginning of, of, uh, of huge interests around creating markets for farmers because we've noticed that it, markets are becoming more a limiting factor. The input system is are beginning to work, but markets are becoming a limiting factor. And I think it's the case for Rwanda just as, like it is the case for many other countries. And the convening power of Graphica Investment Forum, a plug for you, Lauren, seems to be working. There are lots of conversations. Yes. Let's just finally, I can't help myself, one last question. Jai, let's just widen it out. You mentioned about food import export and your interest in other areas or other food chains. How, how, uh, where does Africa feature as part of your, your global plan? Um, you know, uh, UPL is a global company and we are present in almost 120 countries. Uh, Africa is, uh, is an exciting place to be for us. Uh, it's not uh, a key market, but it is somewhere where we think that the technologies which we can bring to the table 
particularly with our heritage being Indian, and we, have, we are dealing with millions of small farmers on a daily basis in India. Average farm size in India may be same or smaller than in Africa. Uh, we believe that all our experience and knowledge and technologies which we have developed to deal with small farmers can really uh, create an impactful, uh, can, a huge impact f in, in Africa. And it's something which comes naturally to us. Uh, so we believe that over the next uh, uh, 10, 15 years, uh, UPL and it's our experience, our ability to work with smallholder farmers, uh, we, we, can, we can make a huge impact. Uh, and that's why we are excited about being in Africa. Fascinating. Well, it's been an absolute pleasure to see how our, our cousins at the Grow Africa Investment Forum have been uh, working on for the past two days. Really exciting to see great progress being made. I'd like to thank you for joining us here today. I'd like to thank you for joining us here in the room and for watching us live on WeForum.org. This session is now over. Thank you.